I invite you to take a Bible and turn to the book of Ruth. If you need to borrow a Bible, there's one in the rack in front of you. It looks something like this. And if you take one of these Bibles and turn to page 210, you'll be at this amazing little book in the Old Testament entitled Ruth. The story of Ruth, this book that we've been looking at, is essentially a love story. It's a love story between a widow named Ruth and a man named Boaz. It's also a love story between that same widow Ruth and the mother-in-law from her first marriage, Naomi. But more than anything else, it's a love story between God and us. And as we've looked at this story, we've looked at it from the perspective first of Naomi, the mother-in-law, and we saw that even though she was experiencing bitterness, God's kindness led her to repentance and rescued her. We also looked at it from the, uh, the point of view of Boaz, the man, the husband, in the story, and we saw how God in his kindness rescued Boaz from his fear that was immobilizing him from doing the thing he needed to do. This morning, we have the opportunity to look at the book of Ruth through the character of Ruth. And we invite you in the same way that I have in the past couple of weeks, that just like with Naomi or with Boaz, the invitation is to see ourselves in their story, to see what ways our story resonates with their story. Today, as we look at this person of Ruth, this very real woman, I invite you to see yourself in her personality, to look for the same weaknesses in your personality that she has in hers, and to see the kindness of God to her, and to look for that same kindness in your own life. So this morning, let's be introduced again to this character of Ruth, and so we want to be in verse three of chapter one. Now the setup is, a woman, Naomi, and her husband, Elimelech, left Israel and moved to Moab, which is modern-day Jordan, because of a famine in Israel. While they're there, uh, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, dies. We pick up the story, verse 3. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, and the other, Ruth. Now we're going to find out in just a little bit that Ruth's husband that she marries here after they've lived together for 10 years dies. But this is the character that we're looking at today. And what I want to first point out about her, we're gonna spend some time talking about her personality. But before we do, I wanna talk about the most salient feature about her circumstances and where she is. Now, you might assume that the most salient feature about Ruth's circumstances is that she's a widow. I'm sure that is very important, but that does not appear to be what the narrator and what God ultimately wants us to see as the most salient feature of what Ruth is experiencing. What is the most salient feature? Well, she's introduced to us as a Moabite woman. Now, that's how she's introduced in verse three of chapter one. Look down at verse 22 of chapter one. Naomi and Ruth are returning from Jordan, or from Moab, back into Israel. It says, so Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law. Now that's perhaps not surprising because they're returning back to Israel and so the narrator is reminding us that as they come back into Israel, don't forget this woman is a Moabite. She's not an Israelite. Okay, fine. Chapter two, verse two. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, well at this point we know she's from Moab. We know she's a Moabite woman but she's still being introduced as Ruth the Moabite. Jump down to verse six. Ruth is now going to glean in the fields of this man named Boaz. 
Boaz shows up. He doesn't know who this woman is who is uh, picking grain in his field. So he goes to the supervisor and says, who's that woman? Verse six, she's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. He doesn't say that's Ruth. It's It's like she doesn't even have a name. How do we know this woman? She's the Moabite. And in Bethlehem, when you said the Moabite, we all know who you're talking about. It's this woman, Ruth. Jump down to verse 21. Ruth comes home after picking the grain, and she says to Naomi, it went fantastic. Verse 21. Then Ruth the Moabite said, now Naomi, of all people, knows Ruth is from Moab. She was there. But still, it's Ruth the Moabite. Now, interestingly, in chapter 3, no references to Ruth the Moabite. There's references to Ruth. Now, chapter 3 is the most intimate part of the story. It's the exchange of love between Boaz and Ruth where they are, uh, where Ruth is proposing to Boaz. So it's interesting, in this very interpersonal interaction, she's not called Ruth the Moabite. She's just Ruth. Jump down to chapter 4. Verse 5. There's someone who has a closer claim on Ruth, Mr. So-and-so, as he's called in this story. Verse 5, Boaz is interacting with him, and he says, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow. And then down to verse 10. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite. Now, it's true that she's a widow, and I know that's an important part of her experience, but the most salient feature of this woman and her experience is that she is a foreigner. And it's like the narrator doesn't want us to forget it because she can never forget it. Living in the town of Bethlehem, Ruth is constantly reminded of the fact that she's not an Israelite. She's an outsider. She's from Moab. She is not originally part of this people. Now, I wonder if you have anything like this in your life. I wonder if you have any experience that there's something about who you are, or something about uh, your identity, that everywhere you go, it's there with you. I know a little of what this feels like. Anytime as an Arab, I travel to Israel. It's immediate. You don't have to do anything. I don't have to actually pull out my passport. Immediately, I'm recognized as being an Arab. And when I walk through passport control, I think to myself, okay, here we go. Maybe you feel that way if you have black skin. And anywhere you go in this country... It's always there with you, and it's always somehow part of your identity. Maybe you know what that's like if you have some sort of special needs, physical special needs, and everywhere you go, people identify that thing with you, that somehow it's a part of you. Maybe you have an accent. And whenever you speak in this country... It sounds different, and it's an immediate identifying feature of who you are. See, Ruth is a widow, but you can't tell she's a widow by looking at her. She is a foreigner, and everybody seems to have that be the identifying feature of who she is. And so the narrator wants to keep reminding us that she is a foreigner in this place because Ruth can't forget it either. And that's the most salient aspect of her experience right now. She's a Moabite living in Israel. Okay, well, what about her personality? Well, we can see Ruth's personality come out in each of the first three chapters of the story. Let's start in chapter one. In chapter one, Naomi's husband has died. Ruth and Orpah's husbands have died. And so Naomi is essentially like, look, my life is absolutely miserable. I might as well go home and die in Bethlehem rather than die here in Moab. So she's going to travel back to Israel, and her two daughters-in-law agree to go with her. Naomi doesn't actually want them to come with her. We talked about this when we went through Naomi's story. She doesn't want to be responsible for them. And 
it's clear if you come back with a foreigner, the people in Bethlehem are going to do nothing except identify this woman as being from Moab. And, and Naomi is like, I don't want to have to put up with that. Now she's missing this amazing, huge blessing. But Naomi tries to talk her daughters-in-law out of coming with her. Orpah's like, okay, I'll stay here. Pick it up in verse 15. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. That's how we know this is not the Lord God who's behind this. (laughs) Because Naomi is sending Orpah back to her gods. She says to Ruth, go back with her. But listen to Ruth's response. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Do you hear Ruth's personality in there? I love the way the Bible characterizes her. She's a determined woman. This is one of the great speeches in the Bible, and she essentially says to Naomi, hey, look, I don't care if you want me or not, you're getting me, and I'm coming with you. She's got a stronger personality than her mother-in-law does. And Naomi realizes, look, there's no point in getting an argument with Ruth. She's made up her mind. She's going to do what she's going to do. That's the first sort of picture we have of Ruth's personality. She's a strong woman. She's a determined woman. And by the way, that's a good thing. This is being presented as a commendable thing in the scriptures. When I say it's one of the best speeches, it's because the Lord is the one who's giving her that strength and that determination and that steadfastness. Chapter two, they move back to Bethlehem. Well, now we need some food. How are we going to eat? So verse two of chapter two, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now, again, we see her personality. Ruth is like, hey, look, we need some food. I better go get some work. She doesn't wait for Naomi to suggest this. This is Ruth's idea. This is her idea. And she goes and says, hey, look, I'm going to do this. I also think it's interesting that she just picks the field. I would have thought, you say to your mother-in-law, hey, could you go around with me and help make some introductions? You know all these people. Everybody knows Naomi. I would have thought, hey, look, on day one, could you at least come with me and kind of introduce me to some people and kind of smooth the way so that I... She doesn't do that. She's just going to go pick a field. The other thing I love about this, this is a Moabite, remember? She's not from Israel. The Mosaic law is not her law. She shows up and says, hey, by the way, it says in here you got to let me glean in your field. I love this. Here you have a Moabite who's claiming the Mosaic law against these Israelites and say, look, it says I can pick. I'm here to pick. Show me where. (laughs) Great. So she works hard all day. Boaz shows up middle of the day, goes to the supervisor. Who's that lady over there? This is the, that's the Moabite. He says, and she's a hard worker. She's worked all day. She's only taken one break. She'll end in the shelter to get a drink. We find out she not only works all morning long, she works all day long and into the evening where she threshes her own grain and takes home a huge amount of food. And Naomi's like, wow, where did you get all that food? Now, some of it is due to Boaz's generosity. But some of it's due to the fact that Ruth is a hard worker. Do you see her personality again? Here is this strong, determined woman. She's not waiting for introductions. She's not waiting for somebody in Israel to figure out they got a law that says they're supposed to take care of her. She's like, look, I'm here to pick your food. Show me where to start. That's Ruth's personality. Now, we really see her personality come out in chapter 3. At some point, 
as God clears away the weeds of bitterness for Naomi, Naomi is able to see for Ruth and for Boaz, look, the two of you should be married. You belong together. And so Naomi gives Ruth some advice and says, hey, look, you need to make yourself available to Boaz. And so in chapter three, we actually have Ruth proposing marriage to Boaz. Now, the way this works, and again, it's a different custom than we're used to, but the idea was is that Boaz is there at the threshing floor with all the other workers late at night. Ruth kind of waits until everybody's laid down, uh, and then she goes and uncovers Boaz's feet and lays at his feet. In the middle of the night, I think, God wakes Boaz up, and he looks and sees that there's a woman lying at his feet. Verse 9, who are you, Ruth, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth. Notice she doesn't say, I'm your servant, Ruth, the Moabite. (laughs) She doesn't think of herself as a, she's just Ruth. (laughs) I'm your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Now, in order to really point out Ruth's personality here, I need to compare what happens here with a couple of other verses earlier in the story. So what I want you to do is keep your eyes and fingers sort of here on verse 9, On the screen, I'm going to put a verse uh, from chapter 2, verse 13, and you're going to kind of have to look back and forth between these two to see what's happening. We start in chapter 2, verse 13. This is when she's in the field, and she's meeting Boaz for the first time. She says to him, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant. And that's the word I want you to notice though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. That word servant, shifach, it's the lowest of the low on the ladder of servants. This is a person that she's basically saying, look, I'm here to glean from the field, but if you ranked all the workers in the field, the poor who are gleaning are at the very bottom. And she's acknowledging the fact that Boaz is being kind to her even though she's at the bottom rung of being sort of a servant. Now, it's metaphorical. She's not really his servant, but that's the idea. Now, look at verse 9. I say look. You can't see it in English, but I'm going to show it to you. Who are you? I am your servant, Ruth. Now, in Hebrew, the really interesting thing is this is a different word for servant. This is not the word shichach. It's the word ama. This servant, this word for servant, is higher up the ladder. Now, the problem with a shiha is that it's so low on the chain that such a person would never be allowed to marry someone of Boaz's social standing. She could have been his concubine, but not his wife. An ama is higher up the social standing, and she can be married to Boaz. And so what I think is so great is somewhere between chapter two and chapter three, Ruth promoted herself. (laughs) She did, she gave herself a promotion. Now again, she's not a servant, so she didn't actually get a promotion. But when she first meets Boaz, she's got no interest necessarily in marrying him. She's just like, hey, look, I'm the lowest of the low. Thank you for being kind to me. All of a sudden, it dawns on her, wait a second, I don't want to marry this guy. I can't marry him if I'm that kind of servant. I'm just going to make myself this kind of servant. That's Ruth's personality. Second passage to compare it to. Chapter 3, uh, verses 2 to 4. So again, you're still looking at verse 9, and I got up here. Okay, a couple of things from this. This is Naomi encouraging Ruth to go and uh, take the initiative with Boaz. She says, now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. That's what Naomi says. What does Ruth say, look at verse 9, when she talks to Boaz? Spread the corman of your garment over me, since you are a relative? No, no a guardian redeemer. That's not what Naomi said. Naomi just says, hey, look, this guy's related to us. That makes him a candidate for you to marry. That's not what Ruth does. Ruth says to him, you have an obligation to marry me. You see the difference? 
Here is a Moabite woman claiming Mosaic law to a Jewish man saying, oh, by the way, it's not just that you're a relative. You have a responsibility according to your law to be a guardian redeemer for me. That's for his personality. One more thing. Notice the last line of verse four. Look at what Naomi actually tells Ruth to do. When he lies down, note the place where he's lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then what? He will tell you what to do. Is that what Ruth does? Look at your verse again. What does Ruth actually do? Spread the corner of your garment over me. Now again, in our culture, we're like, is she cold? I don't understand this. That's because we don't use this kind of language. But in that culture, this is a marriage proposal. Boaz recognizes it as a marriage proposal. She intends it as a marriage proposal. But that's not what Naomi told her to do. Naomi just said, let him know you're available. Let him know you're interested. Ruth's like, Forget that. If he hasn't done anything so far, I'm not going to wait to see what he does. She takes matters into her own hands and says, by the way, you're a guardian redeemer and I'd like you to marry me. (laughs) That's Ruth's personality. And by the way, it's beautiful. It's put in scripture because it's a great model. It doesn't mean you have to be like Ruth, but if you are like Ruth, that's being affirmed. That kind of determined, strong female character is being emphasized and affirmed. Now, I try to think today, how might you or I sort of relate to this character? Well, I thought about maybe you are here from a foreign country. The amount of determination and fight you have to put in to try to make it in this place when a culture that's different than your own Maybe you are African-American. The kind of fight you have to have to make it in a society that is not designed for you to succeed. Or maybe you're a woman. Also, society is not designed for you to succeed. Or a widow. Perhaps you are a young adult and you're just sort of finishing school and you're getting ready to find a job and you've been listening to the educational system tell you, you got to take control of your destiny. You've got to make this happen. You got to get good grades. You got to get a job. You got to make, that's Ruth. That's that sort of personality. Maybe you're the oldest child in your family or the responsible one. And it's been your responsibility to take care of all of your siblings or to take care of your parents. And you've had to become that kind of person who's in charge and in control. That's Ruth's personality. Maybe you have a special needs child and you've had to fight for that child to get, make sure that they have a good experience again in a society that's not designed to take care of them. And you've become the kind of person who is determined and strong and forthright in your dealings with people. That's Ruth's personality. Maybe you've come out of a financially difficult situation. Maybe you're in that now and you've had to fight and strive and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and work hard to make something happen. That's Ruth's personality. Maybe you're a medical personnel and you have other people's lives in your hands and you have to take control to try to tell them, here's what you need to do. Don't do that anymore. We've got to try to rescue this situation. Maybe you're a leader in the business world and people are looking to you and you're making decisions and you have to be that kind of strong, type A, determined personality. If that resonates with you, that's Ruth. That's who she is. And that's a good thing. Again, you don't have to be like that, but if you are like that, that's, that's presented here as being a good thing. However, with every personality type, there is a weakness. When it came to Naomi, we looked at her weakness, which was the danger of allowing bitter circumstances to turn into bitterness. With Boaz, we looked at this strong moral character who fears the Lord so much that he wants to obey him. The downside is he can also fear doing something else and he was immobilized to do what he was supposed to do. And so we saw the danger of fear. What is the danger with Ruth's personality? It's control. This strong, determined person 
is in danger of taking matters into their own hands and trying to control the circumstances. Now, the great thing about Ruth in this story, she's definitely a a heroine in the story in the sense of we don't have any examples of her actually sinning. But we need to acknowledge that she still needs the kindness of God, but in a preventative way. Where do we see that? Verse 18 of chapter 3. After Ruth proposes to Boaz, Boaz says to her, look, I'm so ecstatic to marry you, but there's somebody else who has a closer claim than I do. I got to go work this out. Ruth goes home and tells Naomi, it went pretty well. He was for marrying me, but we got this other guy, Mr. So-and-so. Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Now, if I've got Ruth's personality, if you've got Ruth's personality, there are a couple things about that you're not going to like. Right? Number one is what? It's what? It's weight. Right? This is not the kind of person. Ruth does not have the waiting personality. She's the kind of person, look, we need food. I'm going to go get the food. I'm going to start working and I'm going to come home with food at the end of the day. The idea that she's got to wait, that doesn't resonate with her. The other part of it is, The man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Now listen, here's what's about going to happen. Boaz is going to go to the city gate, call the elders together, and he's going to negotiate for his marriage to Ruth. If I've got Ruth's personality, or if you've got Ruth's personality, here's how I want the negotiation handled if I'm Ruth. I'm going to show up and I'm going to say to Mr. So-and-so, hey, look, I know you got a closer claim on me than he does, but I tell you what, you try to marry me, you will be the most miserable man on the face of the earth. (laughs) right? You're going to tell him this determined personality, I'm marrying Boaz, what are you going to do about it? Isn't that what you're going to do? Right? That's not what Boaz does. Boaz shows up and says, hey, Mr. So-and-so, there's a field for sale. You want to buy it? If I'm Ruth, I'm like, no, no, that's not how we do this. Mr. So-and-so says, yeah, sure, I'll buy it. Now imagine what Ruth is thinking. What a moron. Why did you offer the field? (laughs) Only as he works it through do we find out that, okay, Mr. and -and so-and-so has no concern for Ruth whatsoever. He only wants the field. And when Ruth gets thrown in, Mr. So-and-so says, no, thank you. It all works out great in the end. But you know what the hard thing for Ruth is? She's got to trust somebody else to do this. Somebody else who to this point has not taken the initiative, right? Right? Now, we could see this as a burden for Ruth, but what we're supposed to see it as is the kindness of God. It's preventative. We don't have any examples of Ruth doing something in this story that she shouldn't have done. But I get the feeling she's on the verge of it. And so God, in his kindness, puts Ruth in a situation which is outside of her control. She can't do anything about the negotiation. She's not allowed to show up at the city gate and to fight for herself. She's got to wait, and she's got to trust, and she has to not just trust God, she's got to trust Boaz. This is the kindness of God. Why? Because Ruth is in danger. She's in danger of stealing from God something that he deserves. Do you know what that thing is? Praise. The problem with this kind of type A, strong-willed, determined, godly personality is you can make the mistake of thinking that you have redeemed yourself. Ruth is the one who makes the relationship with Naomi happen. Ruth is the one who gets herself a job. Ruth is the one who gets this marriage proposal done. And the danger is, is that she's going to get to the end of the story and think, I did a pretty good job. And so God's kindness to her was to give her a situation outside of her control so that when she gets to the end of the story, she'll be in the same spot where Boaz and Naomi are, which is God is my redeemer. 
God is my rescuer. And it was not the curse of God that she ended up in a situation outside of her control. It was the kindness of God so that when he came to rescue her, she would not be deceived into thinking it was her own strength or her own personality or her own determination that brought this about. It was God and God alone. Now, the last two weeks, we've given you the opportunity to come forward during some singing time if you needed to do business with the Lord. Two weeks ago, if you struggled with bitterness, we just simply wanted you to come forward and acknowledge that to the Lord. Last week, if something is frightening you and immobilizing you, through we just wanted you to give you the opportunity to be able to commit that to the Lord. This morning, we'll give you the same opportunity. We got about 10 minutes. I'm going to get up to pray at the end of it. So if you're down here, don't feel like I'm going to miss the cue and not be. You just come and interact with the Lord. And here's who I want to come. If your situation is number one, you're in a position where God has placed something or is trying to place something outside of your control and you are fighting him tooth and nail to keep control of that situation. If you are refusing to acknowledge that God wants to be your redeemer and you're still trying to be your redeemer in that situation, I want to give you the opportunity while we're singing just to come forward and confess that to the Lord. Ruth doesn't sin in this situation, but it is possible to sin in the situation. It's possible to try to take matters into our own hands that we shouldn't take into our own hands. I want to give you the chance to do that. Second, if you are in a situation and you realize that you're not supposed to be in control or you can't be in control, but you're having trouble waiting or you need help from God in trusting that God is going to work through some others who haven't shown themselves to be super reliable to this point, or you just need God to give you kindness, or you just simply want to come and say, please hurry up, Lord. Like, I'm here, and I'm waiting, but I need that help, and I'd like it to come as soon as possible. We want to give you the opportunity uh, to come down here, spend that time with the Lord. Like I said, we've got 10 minutes. We're going to be slightly over. I understand that, but we're not going to cut short this time. So we've got 10 minutes. As the Lord leads, uh, come and do business with the Lord. I'll get back up at the end and close us in prayer.